says, O magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We're going to begin this morning by singing number 768 in our blue books, Through All the changing scenes of life in trouble and in joy, the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ. Number 768. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. How we thank you, O Lord, our God, that indeed we do draw near to the one who is near to us and whose angels encamp all around those who know you, who love you, who fear your name. 
and they are there to bring great deliverance to us from every evil, from every threat. And you yourself have made yourself to us a shield, a refuge from every storm, a place of extraordinary peace and rest. Even amid the turmoil of this world, full as it is of sin, of curse, of tragedy, what a joy and comfort it is to us, Lord, to know your abiding peace all around us, never to believe us, never to forsake us. Even in the face of our many sins, our many follies, our shortcomings, our blunders. And to know, Lord, that we, we come before you knowing that you are the God who delights in being our Savior, who loves to show yourself to us as our glory, as the one who lifts up our head, even even when we are cast right down in the dust. And so, Lord, we bow before you this Lord's Day morning with thankful hearts, hearts full of joy and thanksgiving, and with such a sense of relief and of peace. Because as we've sung, we know that for those who fear your name, there need be no fear in this world. Nothing that this world can ever throw at us, not even what the devil himself can throw at us to make us stumble, to make us fall. None of these things shall ever conquer those upon whom your blessing rests. So draw near to us, we pray, to strengthen our faith and trust in you, to open our eyes afresh to the wonders of your great love. As we come to you, O oh God, our Father, the hearer of prayers, hear the prayers of your children as we bring them to you this morning in words expressed and in the deep words of our hearts, unexpressed but known to you. Come to us, we pray, and help us and save us. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, let me warmly welcome you to our fellowship this morning, especially those who are visiting with us. And uh, if it's your first time with us here at uh, one of our meetings at the Tron Church, then uh, you're very welcome indeed. And I hope that you will feel very much at home with us here as a fellowship of God's people. Can I draw your attention to these sheets? I think you have uh, these on your seats. And uh, the front page there tells us about our other services taking place this afternoon and this evening uh, at Queen's Park here at 5.30 for Farsi and at 6.30 at Kelvin Grove. Do come and join us at one of these if you're able and uh, use that time to uh, share fellowship again. On the inside, you'll see details on the left about uh, our provisions for young people this morning, for various other things. On the right-hand side, the calendar for this coming week. Lots of things there. Do take note of the things that you're directly involved with. Uh, or might like to be involved with. Can I draw your attention to our prayer meeting, our congregational prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7.30. Do come and join us all as we uh, pray for God's work throughout the world and with our many uh, mission partners around the world. On the back page, uh, a few things to mention there. You'll see that uh, our new arrangements for the evenings have gone so well. We're uh, going to continue with that. And um, our next joint evening meeting we hope will be Sunday evening on Easter Sunday when all our congregations will gather together for an evening of uh, Easter praise and uh, we hope admission of new members so do pop that in your diary see there about members and uh, also about singers this is not uh, our version of Tron's Got Talent but uh, Matt is hoping to conduct uh, a sizable choir for an Easter concert of uh, this lovely piece Stainer's Crucifixion and uh, looking for people to join the choir there is one requirement You've guessed it, you can actually sing. But uh, if you think you might be able to sing, speak to Matt and he may be able to tell you whether you can or not. And uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to hear from you. So you'll see their rehearsals are starting soon. Uh, so uh, budding singers, do take note. Now, you have an insert here as well. Last Sunday we were speaking about the uh, 
consultation that the Scottish Government is currently in the midst of on hate crime. And there are some very concerning, worrying uh, possibilities for the legislation that might uh, go onto our statute books. And um, if we don't want some of those things to happen, then we have to take part in this consultation. We can't complain about our government passing laws if we don't give them our opinions so they can represent us properly. And um, so last Sunday evening, we were hearing about that from uh, the Christian Institute. I've heard that um, some people have tried to do that, and I find it difficult um, on the online uh, feedback portal. And um, there are also ways of doing it on paper. So we thought it would be helpful, since it is so important, um, to give opportunity to help anybody who's having difficulty with it. You'll see um, uh, this afternoon and also on Wednesday. So if you're having difficulty, please come along to one of those and somebody who knows how to do it will help you to do it. If you haven't thought about it yet or haven't looked, please let me encourage you to do that. Uh, it's really, really important that we uh, make our voices heard on this. Uh, so please, can I commend that to you uh, for your attention? Then finally, uh, this morning, uh, I need to tell you some sad news, and that is that uh, there have been a number of uh, deaths just in the last couple of days that uh, we uh, need to acknowledge and think about. And one is uh, that our uh, former member, Devine McRitchie, died in the early hours of Saturday morning. Devine, as you know, moved through to be looked after in Edinburgh, uh, near to her daughter, and uh, she died uh, just uh, the day before yesterday. And so do have her family, David and Joan, here in the home at Ritchie family uh, in your prayers. And we will want to give thanks uh, for the life of our dear sister, who was so much part of our fellowship here for many, many years. Please also do have in your prayers uh, the Mason family, and particularly Annabel, whose uh, brother died very suddenly on Saturday morning, uh, it seems as well. He was just with her here last Sunday. And uh, only age 53, it's been a terrible shock for the family. So do remember the Mason family. Uh, she will be traveling up to Stornoway with her sister, I think, uh, tomorrow. And then finally, also on uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, saw the death of uh, George Philip, who was, uh, as many of you know, the minister of Sandiford Henderson Church here in Glasgow for 40 years. And uh, was a fearless and faithful proclaimer of the gospel in the city. And uh, I'm sure you'll want to remember his family, uh, our extended family, and uh, the many who will be giving thanks for his ministry and many who will be giving thanks for their salvation uh, through uh, his proclaiming of the gospel in our city for so many uh, years. Uh, he was 93, and we thank God for his, uh, for his long and faithful life and ministry. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices at your uh, leisure. We're going to turn now to our Bible readings for this morning which you'll find uh, once again in Psalm number 3 that we're going to be reading together. So if you'd like to turn up Psalm 3, page 448, if you have one of the visitor's Bibles, and um, put your finger in there, and then if you'd like to turn back uh, to 2 Samuel chapter 16, which you'll find on the church Bibles, page 268. And we're going to read some uh, verses from there that explain a little of the background of this Psalm of David. So, 2 Samuel 16, at verse 5, and then Psalm 3. And the story here in 2 Samuel 16 is of uh, David, the king, being run out of Jerusalem, the capital, uh, through being faced with a rebellion of the people, the soldiers, many of the people, led by his own son Absalom. And... Not only was he forced out of the city, but in a state of great ignominy. And here uh, we read of curses raining down upon him and his party. When King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in which you place you've reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you for you are a man of blood. 
Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road, while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, and threw stones at him and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he refreshed himself. I turn to Psalm number 3, which we're told is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. We're going to sing again now from our Blue Books number 503. A great hymn that reminds us that before the throne of God above, we have a strong and a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for us. Number 503.
Well, as our offerings are received now and as the musicians play quietly, you might like to be uh, reading over, meditating on this psalm that we'll be looking at, or perhaps just uh, to be in prayer, particularly for some of these uh, folk bereaved that we've been thinking of. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received. pray together. Our God and our Father, we bow before you and as we think of our giving, not just in monetary terms, but in all of our service committed here together to serve you in this city and in this world, our minds and our hearts are turned to the world outside, to this world of human life that we inhabit, a world so full of turmoil in so many different ways across the nations of our world. And it seems that we live increasingly in days of uncertainty, in days of rising strife between nations, politically, economically, and even fears that these things might escalate to something worse. We live in days in our own country of great uncertainty, perhaps unknown for many generations. And we're so conscious, Lord, of the frailty, the fragility of our society and of our leaders. When we read in the newspapers of the quandary that our politicians are in over the return of those who have left our country to fight terrorist wars and who still profess against our population desires and threats of evil and destruction, and yet our politicians seem hamstrung, not knowing where they stand in the face of the law, not knowing what to do, not knowing how to meet their obligations to protect the public with their duties in international law. And we see, Lord, in the same way across our society, across the issues that are facing the leaders of our nation and others today, a similar uncertainty, a discord, the fragmentation that is increasingly evident in our government and in our own parliament over the issue of leaving the European Union. How thankful we are, O oh God our Father, that we know that our fate is not in the hands of merely our elected representatives, <coughs> but that we come before you whose throne is set in heaven and who truly holds this whole world in your hands. And so, Lord, we know that the greatest need for our nation and indeed every nation today is not greater trade or greater understanding of economics, not better laws, 
or new innovations in technology, but an understanding that comes from your truth about what human life is really all about, what this world's purpose is, and why any of us are here at all. And we know, Lord, that that great truth can only come from one place, which is the Church of Jesus Christ our Lord. Never was there such a need for clarity and for courage and for commitment in proclaiming the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ your Son, in whom and by whom and for whom all things were made and through whom alone all things hang together. Now this world does not depend upon the capricious changes to our climate, whether the world is warming or cooling, or whatever the latest fad might suggest to us, whatever the wisest scientists might tell us. But ultimately, Lord, the whole future of this universe is aligned with the purposes of your glory and grace. We thank you, Lord, for the comfort and for the courage that the knowledge of the truth of your heavenly purposes gives to us as your church here on this earth. But we acknowledge also, Lord, the great responsibilities that such knowledge brings to us also to make known your goodness, to hold out the words of the psalmist to this world, to taste and see that the Lord is good, that the goodness, the richness, the beauty, the desires of every human heart seeking for these things will be satisfied only in one place, in the one who is the giver of all these good things, you and you alone. So, Lord, we acknowledge the great need in our generation for the proclamation of that great gospel with courage, with commitment, with clarity. And we thank you, Father, as we think of that for the ministry of George Philip here in this city for these 40 years and more, when courage and clarity and commitment to your truth bore such fruit among the lives of many, many hundreds and hundreds of people coming to know you through the gospel of your Son, and so many scores being sent into service of Christ in churches throughout this nation and indeed to many nations of the world. Some here, no doubt, in this building today, owing their salvation to that ministry and its fruit. Thank you for many similar, Lord, in the generations that have gone before us, who have shown us the way to be truthful and steady and clear and committed to Christ, unswerving in the face of great criticism and unabashed to proclaim the truth and the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help us, Lord, in our day, we pray that we should not be found wanting, that through many decades of ease and of prosperity, you would not allow us in your church to grow warm and fuzzy and to fail to stand for that radical Christian gospel, which alone is the answer to the great needs of our day. Forgive us, Lord, we pray, for so often we put our own needs, our own desires, our own comfort ahead of your great calling to us, which is to be soldiers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be athletes who run the race so as to obtain, to be those who are faithful even unto the end, so, Lord, help us, we pray this morning, as we gather as your people here, to bear the great responsibilities that you have given us. And give us, we pray, the confidence that we so greatly need, but which you so wonderfully give to us in the gospel of your Son. That we might be a people whose confident faith is evident in courageous proclamation of the saving way of our great Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. So to that end, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts afresh 
and send us on our way rejoicing in the power of your great truth, the gospel, which is indeed the power of salvation for all who believe. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again the hymn on the screens. Our Father God who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children. Well, turn with me, if you would, to uh, Psalm 3, page 448, I think, in the, uh, in the church Bibles. And we're looking particularly at the last two verses of the psalm this morning, which tell us of the great confidence that the true believer can really have, because real Christianity promises to us a certain salvation. It's the third uh, week looking at this psalm and what it has to teach us about real Christianity, about real biblical faith, as opposed, that is, to the fantasy that uh, some people, even some, some so-called Christians and churches, imagine our religion to be. And I hope already we've seen just how realistic this psalm is about uh, the life of faith. But there's absolutely no fantasy at all here. Uh, about the lever, believer's life being uh, a bed of roses or uh, that there's any sort of sense of the nonsense that some people think about and talk about our faith when they say, well, you know, Christian faith is a crutch. It's just a delusion. It's there to, to help you forget or to ignore the harsh realities of life and pretend that life is somehow different. No, 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 quite the reverse. 
The very first thing that we saw in this psalm about real faith is that it puts the believer immediately into great conflict, that real Christianity means a constant struggle. Look at verse 1. O Lord, how many are my foes? That's the cry of, of the psalmist, of King David, of the anointed king of God over his people Israel. And as we saw, here is the Lord's anointed himself being despised and opposed by all, even, even rejected by his own people. And he's cursed, he's rejected, he's being driven out of his city, Jerusalem. And not just driven out with insults, but actually with rocks raining down on him from his enemies, as we read in 2 Samuel 16. And you remember what we read there? They were bombarding not just David, but all the servants of King David and all the people and mighty men on his right hand and on his left. And friends, the Bible tells us that will always be so for all of those who stand with the Lord and stand with the Lord's anointed. They will always be despised and rejected on this earth. What did the Lord Jesus himself say so plainly to his followers on the very eve of his own suffering and his crucifixion? Well, we read in John chapter 15, Jesus says, Because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. All these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. That is the only true God in heaven. And friends, that is how it has always been from the people uh, of true faith, right? From the very beginning. Go back to the beginning of your Bible, the book of Genesis, the first few chapters. What do you find? Abel, the man of faith, persecuted and then killed by his own brother, by Cain. Then you go on and read of Ishmael, who persecuted Isaac, the one who was born, says Paul, according to the Spirit. And all through, all through the history of God's people, right up to the present day church of Jesus Christ. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That was Paul's words, wasn't it? In, in Acts chapter 14, as he went around encouraging the newly planted churches all over the ancient world to continue in the faith, as Paul said. Notice the faith. This is the only true Christian faith that there is. And that's what we're seeing right back here in the experience described in Psalm 3. And that is because what we saw in Psalm 2, verse 2, is always true. The nations, their people, their kings, their rulers set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. And therefore against all the people of the Lord and his anointed. So I was reading just this very week in the newspaper, as perhaps you were too, about Chinese Communist Party officials going into churches. And this is in the official churches in China, not the underground churches, but even the state-allowed churches. And demanding that the first commandment in the list of the Ten Commandments written on the walls of these churches be taken down. You shall have no other God before me. Because the Communist Party and President Xi will not tolerate a God who is preeminent above the party and the president. And actually, we're not so very far behind, are we, in our Western world today, in our own society, as these consultations about hate crimes and so on are making so plain to us. So make no mistake, for the real Christian, there will always be enemies without. And of course, as we've also seen, there will always be enemies within, which is often worse still for us. The assault of our adversary, who, who Peter says prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And when he does that, using our circumstances, and often it's the very sad and sinful circumstances that we've admired ourselves in by our faithlessness, by our folly, and using them to placard before us our guilt and our shame and our sin. And taunting us constantly, therefore, to erode and to shatter our assurance. That's exactly what's happening in here in verse 2. 
That's what they were saying. There's no salvation for him in God. Look what he's done. Look at the mess. For a man who's made such a mess and and caused so much damage to his family, to his friends, indeed to the whole nation, who's let himself down so very badly. That's so very familiar, isn't it? The tactic of our enemy and our adversary. And how many allies our great enemy has when he accuses and leads that great chorus against us, when when Satan tempts us to despair and tells us of the guilt within. That's a reality of Christian faith that we recognize, isn't it? It's experience that very sadly all of us know only too well. But also is the experience of verse 3, thank God. But the real Christian can also say, despite the reality of verses 1 and 2, can say, but you, Lord, are a shield about me. Despite the reality, which the Bible never hides, that the life of faith involves great conflict and constant struggle, so also the Bible tells us we do have great comfort. We have a continuous shield in the presence of our Lord and Savior himself who is all around us because we have continuous fellowship with him. And the beauty of his presence means that it's he himself who is our refuge. It's he himself who, who is our righteousness and our restorer. Even in the face of the, of the greatest foes, the fiercest foes without and within, He is our shield, our glory, and the lifter of our head. What a beautiful picture that is. And as we saw last time, that untold beauty of his presence with us affords us the unceasing bounty of his provision. We know the miracle of prayer, as verse 4 speaks of, of the God who hears and answers our prayers. And verse 5, we know the miracle of his providence, which surrounds us always as he sustains us and keeps us. And so it's also true that we know the experience of verse 6, the miraculous peace. That means we don't need to fear, even though there are enemies, thousands for David on every side. That's why the Apostle Paul tells the New Testament church that we, as, as true believers in Christ, we can have that peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so you see, that's why... The real believer can always have, despite all, what is displayed here also in verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 3. We can have great confidence that real Christianity promises us a certain salvation. It's not uncertain. It's not tentative and filled with fear about whether we can ever make it, whether we will ever make it to glory in one piece. No, no, no. Our faith is certain. Our faith is assured. Our faith is even triumphant. Even in the face of of everything that the enemy can throw at us. And even in the face often of the very disastrous and damaging consequences of our own sin, of our own mistakes, of our own failures. Which is exactly what is David's situation here in this psalm. And alas, far too often is is our own situation, isn't it, in our lives today? But praise God, the Bible deals in reality. And it meets our real calamities with real Christianity. Not fantasy religion, but real faith. There's no pretending away in the Bible that the true believer must always live with real foes in this fallen world. No pretending away that our struggle is constant that there will be great conflict for every true believer. But there is nevertheless clear proclamation that the true believer does live always in real fellowship with the living God. Therefore, our shield against evil is continuous. And so there is great comfort for every true Christian. And above all, you see, there is also this unswerving promise that the true believer will have always a real future in the kingdom of a victorious Savior. And that's why our salvation is certain. And so there is, and there can be, and in fact there must be, great confidence for every true Christian believer, even in the face of our massive shortcomings, even in the face of my stumblings, which are many, and your stumblings. 
The truth is that our Christian lives are and must be lives of confident faith. And that's what verses 7 or 8 are expressing here in the climax of this wonderful little psalm. Look at them. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be on your people. Now, isn't that extraordinary confidence? Especially when the psalm began with that agonized cry, O Lord, how many are my foes? How can that be? Because nothing seems to have changed, does it, in the, in the reality of the situation? Verse 6 is plain. He hasn't woken up to find that, that God has miraculously removed all these tens of thousands against him. He hasn't woken up and found that God's turned back the clock and everything's back to the way it was before. No, they're still set around about him on every side. So what's going on is the psalmist just pretending. Is this just the worst kind of name it and claim it self-delusion of the charlatan TV evangelist? Is this just the, the, the delusion of those who peddle a prosperity gospel and say, no, 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 you're rich when actually you're poor? Well, no, it's not. This is not the conceit of the religious fanatic. This is the confidence of genuine Christian faith. We need to notice three things, three well, I suppose you'd call them necessary negatives. Three things that David's words express about his faith and about all true biblical faith that help us understand this. And here's the first. There's nothing presumptuous about David's confidence. Nothing presumptuous. His words in verse 7 simply exhibit genuine faith in the promise and in the provision of the God of the covenant, of the Lord whom he knows and trusts. Look at, the, look at the, uh, the ascription there. Arise, O Lord. When you see that word Lord in capital letters, that's the personal name, the covenant name of the Lord himself, Yahweh, Jehovah. And when he says, Arise, O Lord, he's deliberately echoing the words of Moses. You go back and read of the time in the wilderness and you see that Moses would say every time, every time Israel broke camp and moved on in their wilderness wanderings as they moved on towards the land of Canaan or indeed as they set out against their enemies, the ark of God would go before them, be carried by the Levites. And that ark was a living sacrament among them of the, of the presence of God. It was telling them that the presence of the Lord their God was in their midst. And what was in that ark of the covenant? Well, it was the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that God had given to Moses, wasn't it? The covenant of promise that God had made with his people at Sinai that said, I will be your God and Savior, and you will be my people. And in Numbers chapter 10, we're told that whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. It was a wonderfully symbolic action. It was the word of God's promised salvation. It was God's gospel leading his people out on their journey and indeed into battle against all enemies. And it was a supreme act of faith and trust in God's promise to express it that way. A normal army goes out against the enemy, doesn't it, with its heavy armor, not with a Bible. But that's what Moses was doing with Israel. And that's what David's doing here. Arise, O Lord. He's saying, Lord, my confidence is not in me and my men. It's in you. It's in you that I trust, not myself. And I'm throwing my trust on everything that you have promised to me, on your covenant word of salvation. I believe you, Lord. I believe what you have said, that you are our Savior. And I'm taking you at that word. Verse 8, look, salvation belongs to the Lord. It belongs to you. So do as you've promised. May that blessing indeed be on your people. You see, that is not presumption. That's faith. It's trust in the word of God. It's confidence that what God has said will be true is true. And that what God promises, God will accomplish. And that is the confidence of a real believer 
That's what comes from a, a relationship, a knowledge, a fellowship with the God who hears prayer and who answers prayer, a God who promises real salvation. Even when the only thing that we can see around us at the moment is the very present reality of countless enemies. Enemies all around, indeed enemies deep within. But real Christian faith can have confidence. It can have assurance, total assurance, about that salvation from God because we trust in a God who is sovereign, in a God who has power to save, verse 8, in a God to whom salvation belongs. And because we have a God who has promised to save. He is a sovereign God, but he is a saving God. And so it's not presumptuous to say, Lord, save me. You must save me. You must because you can't be untrue to your word. David is prizing God's word as faithful and true. He's giving due reverence to the glory of God as the sovereign savior. And that's why real Christian faith is confident faith. There's no conceit in that. We can have assurance, we can have certainty in our salvation in God just because we know that God is truly sovereign. That salvation belongs not to us, not to anyone else, but to God. And God has promised to give that salvation to all who call on him in truth. He gives it. It's something he gives. It's not something we can earn. But he has it, and he promises it. That was marvelous, the marvelous discovery made by Martin Luther that set off the, the extraordinary events of the Reformation right across Europe 500 years ago. When he discovered that salvation is not something that's locked up in the church. It's not something that's locked up in the hands of the priesthood. It's not something that's dispensed through, through endless ceremonies and penances and confessions that can be never, never completely assured until the last rites are administered at the end of life. No, he discovered that salvation belongs to the Lord and that what the Lord promises, he will deliver to everyone who trusts in those promises, everyone who has faith in him alone. And who shows that faith by crying out to God alone, save me, oh my God. Just as David does here in verse 7. That's why there can be confidence. That's why we can sing, as we will sing later, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in us. No matter how great the present evidence against us seems to be, no matter how countless the foes stacked against us to terrorize may be. There's something greater in the power and the salvation of God who is for us. I love that story in uh, Second Samuel, uh, Second King 6, isn't it? Where Elisha and Elisha's servants are, are shut up in their house in Dothan, and the whole of the army of the king of Syria comes against Elijah's house. And the servant goes out in, in the morning and looks, and he sees this enormous army all around about them, and he's absolutely petrified. He runs in, and he can't believe it that Elisha's just, you know, eating his cornflakes and reading the paper and doesn't seem to be concerned. Haven't you, haven't you realized what's happening? And Elisha says, Go and have another look. And as he's going out, he prays to the Lord and just says, Lord, open his eyes. And he goes out and opens the curtains again. And he sees, yes, the whole army is still there, tens of thousands of them and their horses and chariots. But he looks up and he sees all around about them far greater and vastly more majestic and powerful. The massed armies of the Lord of hosts, the armies of heaven, totally surrounding and outnumbering every enemy against them. And that is what changes everything. And you see, that is what trust in the gospel and God's covenant promises does for us. It doesn't pretend away any reality. It doesn't close our eyes to the real world with all its foes. It doesn't close our eyes to the reality of the mess all around about us, the mess even in our own lives. But it does open our eyes to something far, far greater. Yes, we still see the enemies. Of course we do. But we see the truth. The word that we saw in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, that God's word is the real key to life and to happiness in this world, and that God's Son, above all, 
is enthroned in power and is the one who truly rules this whole cosmos and will judge this cosmos. And therefore, we are enabled confidently to walk by faith, to trust in God's promises. And therefore, we can have confidence even under fire. Whatever the world, whatever the flesh, whatever the devil himself can throw at us, we can say, you save me, O God, because salvation belongs to you. You are the Savior, the Sovereign, and you have promised it to me. You see, confident faith is not presumption. It's simply treating God as God truly is, the Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. But notice also, secondly, there's nothing passive about David's faith either. Real confidence leads him out into battle with the assurance that God will go before him as he trusts him and as he obeys his command to lead out with the Ark of the Covenant. As he says, Lord, let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. See, God is the one who alone can sovereignly bring victory and salvation to his people. But David knows that he has the responsibility to fight the enemy with everything he has. And in fact, that's exactly what he did. If you read on in the story of 2 Samuel 18, you'll see a great victory was won for God's people. Although it was, of course, a great personal cost for David in the death of his own son Absalom that made him grieve. And of course, we know it, don't we? Because the Lord Jesus tells us that sometimes winning, winning the battle that God calls us to does mean losing something that's very precious to us. Take up your cross and follow me is the path of victory for Jesus. And that means denying a great deal and losing a great deal, perhaps, in this world's terms. But you see, these two things always go together in the Bible. On the one hand, God's absolute sovereignty and salvation. And on the other hand, our absolute responsibility to obey God's call, to act in faith and trust, to trust his word of promise, to do what he has said he will do. We can have absolute confidence, absolute assurance, only because God is sovereign. But we must exercise confident faith also for that very reason, because to do any less than that is to deny and to cast doubt on God's sovereignty. To say that we can't have assurance in him and can't have confidence in him actually is to disbelieve his power and to dishonor him as the God of glory. That's so important for us to understand. Sometimes, you see, people are mistaken and people say things like this. Oh, I can't be sure that God could save me because you don't realize just how bad, how, how awful my life has been. You don't believe and understand just how feeble my faith is, even still. So uh, I couldn't possibly presume in that way. But no, the opposite is true. You must trust God. You must have confidence in his salvation because not to do so is to sin in a far, far greater way because you're calling God's word, his promise into question, aren't you? You're calling God a liar. You're calling God's sovereign power into question. You're denying his glory. And above all, you're, you're calling the death of Christ into question. And by thinking that or saying that, you're really saying in some way, well, well Christ's death on the cross wasn't adequate enough for me, to save me from sin. No, no, no. There can be no passivity about real biblical faith. No waiting till you, till you feel something. Till you feel as if perhaps, well, perhaps God is really at work in me. And perhaps really I will be certainly saved. No, no, no. Paul says, the apostle, doesn't he? You are to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is, you are to trust and obey actively. You are to play the part of a servant of God that God has called you to be. For, says Paul, for it is God who is at work in you for his good pleasure. What he's saying is, yes, salvation belongs to the Lord. Yes, he is sovereign indeed. But you, you are not to be passive. You are to be up and active. You are to be confidently exercising faith and trust in him. You are to be saying, arise, save me, oh my God. As the hymn says, forth in your name, O Lord, I go my daily labor to pursue. I'm going out 
in faith and in trust. Never separate God's, God's sovereignty and our responsibility for faith and trust in him. The Bible never, ever separates those things. And we mustn't either. Nor does the Bible ever either separate two other things that this psalm shows it won't separate. And that is the salvation of God's people and the defeat of God's enemies. Look at verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. So we must be absolutely clear there is nothing presumptuous about David's faith. There's nothing passive about that faith. But neither, in emphasizing this last thing, neither is there anything primitive about David's view of God's salvation. Some people would want it that way. They're embarrassed by this kind of talk of smashing enemies. They want to say, well, surely that's the kind of barbarous thing, that's the kind of primitive talk that the New Testament leaves far behind with Jesus. So people sometimes want to soften this and say, well, this talk of breaking the teeth of the wicked, that's just a, that's just a way of saying God will save you out of the jaws of the wicked and save you from their teeth, from a vicious enemy. But that just won't do, will it? I mean, apart from anything else, the image doesn't work, does it? Do you think you're going to smash a lion's teeth by pulling your arm out of its mouth? How many surface have smashed sharks' teeth by managing to hold themselves out of the mouths of sharks? It's ridiculous. And look at the imagery, striking enemies on the cheek. To strike on the cheek is to give a savage blow to a person's pride and dignity. We even have that in our own expression, don't we? We say, that was a right slap in the face. No, it's plain here what's going on. There could be no salvation for David in his current predicament without public defeat and total defeat of his very real and present enemies who were arrayed against him. And all through the whole Bible, God's word is absolutely as clear as they. Ultimate deliverance of God's people comes only through ultimate defeat of all God's enemies and his people's enemies. There is no other way. That's what God's covenant promise promised right from the very, very beginning, way back in Genesis chapter 3. What's the promise? That a human seed will arise from the woman to do what? To crush the enemy underfoot. That and that alone is how the curse of sin will be reversed in the world. And every single victory all the way through the story of the Bible points forward to the ultimate victory of every enemy of God's people. And the great enemies of sin and of guilt and the last great enemy of death itself. Jesus, you see, great David's greater son, he came at last to destroy the works of the devil, says the Apostle John. He came, says Paul, to the Colossians to deliver us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have forgiveness of sins. But how? Only, he says, by disarming powers and authorities, by making a public spectacle, by shaming them, triumphing over them in his cross, breaking their teeth, striking their cheeks with salvation from the Lord and for his people. You can't escape that all the way through the Bible. When you get to the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 6 and 7, there's the great chorus exactly from this psalm of all God's people in earth and heaven shouting, salvation belongs to our God because they see the destruction and the judgment of all his enemies. And the great hallelujah chorus that you know from Handel's Messiah in Revelation 19 is the same. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor power belong to our God for he has judged the whole earth, the city of man, every last enemy of God's people. And friends, that is the grace, that is the wonder of the gospel of our salvation. And that's what links you and me and links every single Christian believer today to David and to his real experience in this psalm. There's nothing primitive about this salvation or about David's faith and trust in God. And indeed, 
What the Bible shows us always is that it's out of the ashes of all human sin that our God works salvation through the triumph of his grace. It was from David's adulterous union that was the cause of all of this pain and anguish, that union with Bathsheba that caused all the calamity. Out of that very union, a son was born named Solomon, and it was through him that God's promise lived on. Until at last, of his seed came the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name, Yeshua, means salvation. He came to destroy forever all his people's enemies and to bring forgiveness of sins to all his own. The salvation that belongs to him, it's poured out on all who trust in Christ so that blessing may be upon them forever so that none can ever destroy or take that away. And that's why you can have confidence as a Christian today. That's why you can have confident faith, not to be passive, but to rise up, to take arms, to fight against every enemy. Not, of course, any longer with the the weapons of earthly warfare. We're not fighting for an earthly kingdom in that way that David was then. But we have the same war cry, Arise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. We have the same promise of God leading the way against enemies without. Paul tells us we fight not with the weapons of the world, not with guns and spears, but with weapons of real power, with the gospel of God that Paul says destroys, destroys every argument that demolishes the strongholds of unbelief and brings every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. We have confident faith in the power of the Word of God to bring even hostile enemies captive to the Lord Jesus Christ and so to find the life that belongs and the blessing that belongs to his people. And we can fight just as confidently against the enemies within because we have the same weapon of the gospel that we can apply as we cherish it, as we trust it in our own lives, as a shield of faith, as Paul calls it, against the arrows of the evil one that penetrate us and make us so often tempted to despair. We can claim confidently, with no conceit, confidently, the righteousness and the peace that no one on this earth can ever rob us of. Because the victory of the Son of God has destroyed all our enemies, has broken their teeth, has drawn their sting. We can live with lives of confident faith. Yes, there will be great conflict. Make no mistake, there will be constant foes right to the end of your Christian walk. But we have this great comfort of continuous fellowship of a Lord who is for us and is for us everything that we can't be for ourselves. He is our shield. He is our glory. He lifts up our head. And so, friends, we can have great confidence. We can have faith to march out into enemy territory tomorrow morning, sure in the knowledge that his great victory is every victory we need. Our salvation is certain in our Lord and our Savior. So if your prayer of late perhaps has been like David's has been at the beginning of this psalm, constantly thinking of of the many enemies, the many foes, the many pressures all around us. Lord, how big are these battles I'm having to fight day after day? Lord, how oppressive these enemies are against my innermost soul. Well, remember, you can have great confidence. Not because deliverance is in your hands, but precisely because It's in his hands because salvation belongs not to us but to the Lord. And that is what means and guarantees that his blessing will be upon his people, all who are his people, forever and ever. And if you are one of Christ's people, then that blessing will be upon you. It will be upon you today and tomorrow and every day as you go on trusting him as your Savior. And you can pray with David, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. He's the God who hears, and he is the God who will answer you, just as he answered him. Salvation belongs to the Lord, 
And so his blessing will be upon his people. Let's pray. Our God and Father, how we thank you that you indeed are the sovereign Lord of earth and heaven and that everything that we place into your hands is safe and secure and can never be taken away. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have confidence in your gracious, sovereign power towards us who believe and that we may therefore go out into the world this coming week, whatever stands in front of us, whatever you call us to do, knowing that you are with us, that you are our shield, you are our glory, and you are the lifter of our head. Help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close a hymn that is a great affirmation of faith, that in Christ alone our hope is found. And so he is our light, our strength, and our song. Salvation belongs to the Lord. His blessing be upon his people. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.